Fantastic. And you know, I want to I want to extend a very warm welcome. Katie, I don't see you yet, but I, I ah, there, there you are. Hey, how are you? You you're still doing? Okay. Nice to see you. It's great to see you. How how have you been? Um busy, but really good. Yeah. I heard you got something something going on over there. Something you know, it's been a, a culmination of years of work in, in our ETF. So we're really excited about it. Well, you know, I know I know at the very end we want to hear all about your ETF. I'm super excited to hear about it. I've I've uh I, I'm, I'm glad that this is happening. This Trader Summit event is happening within very close proximity of you releasing your own uh, ETF, the, the, the tactical ETF, which again, I'm, I'm not going to steal your thunder. I want to hear all about it. Uh, and I know all the other traders want to hear about it as well. But it's really nice having you here, um, a fellow technician. I, you know, it's funny. You know, what I, you know what I drummed up for you today? No, surprise me. I brought... My these are my my uh, old protractors that I used back in the <laughs> '90s to plot Fibonacci levels uh, back in the uh, mid to late '90s, back before we had you know programs and charts to you know actually we used to print out the charts, and 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 every time I talk to a technical person like yourself that you know you, you are you were CMT designated as well, correct? Yeah, as of 2001, believe it or not. So, wow, uh, <laughs> well, 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 you know, uh, we, we're, we're really great friends with those folks. And so, that, you know, it's it's really awesome to talk to a, a, a veteran in technical analysis like yourself. And uh, because you and I speak the same language. And as much as I, as, as much as I like to have, uh, you know, just listening to Dave Hunter just a moment ago and, and a lot of our guests that are going to be on here for the next few days. Um, talking to to them and getting a theme, trading theme that we like we like to to uh, to to think about. Ultimately, price drives the market, right? Yeah, or, or market psychology, right? Drives price. Which there then... we go. Which drives the market. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it's a but it, but it also it it is it, it it's it's funny because if you think about it. You know, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, when you got your CMT, I mean, that that was really at the cusp in the beginning, cutting eight, uh, cutting, uh, how should I say it? It's the beginning of technical analysis, really, as we know it today, because prior to that, and, and, and you know, into the 90s, it was more of a kind of voodoo, right, for, for a lot of market participants. You know, like, I guess, yeah, I, I'm biased against the word voodoo, as you can imagine. I mean, I studied oh, yeah. technical analysis um, academically in, in college, and that was in the mid 90s. And, and so I, I felt like it was very viable then. Um, but but what really changed it, um, I think, in 2001 was the advent of the data, right? Like the data, the access to the data that came with, um, you know, bigger usage of software and, and various tools. Yeah, Besides the protractor. <laughs> that, <laughs> I know it's I feel I feel uh you know I, I feel funny when I pull those out, but I mean that's the, that's the way it was. But you're right, that access to 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 data and really the birth of the internet or really the popularity of the internet as it grew has allowed uh everybody instant access to technical analysis and 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 being able to access charts. But really there are few people. Um, that I know in the markets that I really respect what they do technically, and one of them being you. So it's really, Amazing. really great to have you here. So um, without it. further ado, I, 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 you know, I didn't even, I didn't even uh, uh, introduce you. You are the founder and 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 managing director, co-founder of Fairlead Strategies, correct? That's right. Yeah. So we're we're based in Connecticut, and we've been here since 2018. And um, yeah, so far so good. It feels like still a startup, but now <laughs> I guess we're four years into that startup. Well, that's awesome. And, and now you're an active ETF manager. That's right. Yeah. And that, that is brand new. So that, that truly is a new product and um, new endeavor for us. And, and we're working with a partner on that. And it's also a new endeavor for them. So the learning curve for all of us was pretty steep, um, but I think we're you know, more than excited to see it finally trading. That's awesome. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm super excited to have you here and I'm super excited for everybody that doesn't quite know 
who you are. Maybe they, I don't know, maybe they hadn't seen you on CNBC or some of the other news outlets out there, which, you know, you've been a, a veteran of there too. Um, you know, I'm excited to introduce you to the Trader Summit community. So uh, without further ado, I know you brought a presentation. I want to let you get to it. And I've got a lot of questions for you um, just from a technical perspective on markets that I'm looking at. And, and I know you and I have, have talked uh, quite a bit, but I'm sure your presentation is even going to bring some more questions. Um, and then also I want to mention for those of you at home in your offices watching uh, this right now live, uh, if you have any questions, make sure you bring them to us. Uh, I'm going to try to address as many as we possibly can while Katie is here. So Katie, go ahead. Yeah, of course. And it's not really a formal presentation per se, but but just some key charts. We um, are really nothing without our charts. So it's a good place to start in terms of just getting a sense of not only our take on the markets, but also our discipline and methodology. We, we always approach the markets top down, meaning that we're starting, and this applies mostly to US equities, we're starting major indices, things like the S&P 500 index, and trying to understand how the technical indicators align for those benchmarks, which we then sort of pick apart. We look at the various sectors uh, within them. We look at different market caps. We look at uh, different sort of factors, uh, you know, things high beta, low beta, that type of thing. And then we, of course, do our so-called bottom-up work, which is for us just looking at a lot of charts. We're looking at the whole S&P 500 at least once a week and, and beyond. And, um, you know, with that, you get a, also a good sort of bolstering factor for what you're seeing from a top-down perspective. But we believe that that top-down analysis is incredibly important because I think we've all felt um, sort of the, the market influencing the stocks that we're excited about in ways that are sometimes unfortunate, right? So if, yeah. we're, if we're sort of wrong on the directional bias of the S&P 500, well, then we're probably wrong on most of the stocks that we own. And, um, and of course, we really want to have that market bias, um, you know, correct in order to succeed in the marketplace. Um, right now, we think we're in a pretty difficult market. Um, and that's been something we're saying for now um, a few months. So really late last year, we started to see some sell signals. And I'll actually start with that in terms of the slide deck here. This is a monthly bar chart of the S&P 500. You can see some indicators here. This is the 12 month moving average. Let me get my pointer tool. And so this orange line, that's the 12 month. Nice steep uptrend that we're in still. Um, however, within that context, there's been a pretty notable loss of long-term upside momentum. And something that preceded that was a DeMarc indicator flashing a sell signal late last year, I believe it was October, that we started to say, you know what, I think it's appropriate to move to a neutral longer term bias with these signs of upside exhaustion after what was obviously a very prolonged, steep, and uninterrupted uptrend. And now, of course, since then, we've seen a pretty meaningful loss of upside momentum, although it's fallen short of having any kind of major breakdown. And I'll show you the level we're watching to that end. The stochastics are in the bottom window here, and they're also somewhat of a momentum gauge. We also label it as an overbought or sold gauge. When you see it above this red line, that's a so-called overbought condition. We don't react to that typically until you see this downturn like we have currently. So there's a lot of sort of indications um, that these counter trend signals will give way to more of the same, right? More sort of short to intermediate term volatility. Perhaps overall, it ends up being more of a sideways range band environment, similar to what we had in 2018, when we had some similar signals from those technical indicators that we adhere to. So, so that's our sort of top-down long-term input. And then, of course, we get into the short-term analysis using daily and weekly bar data. And that helps us with market timing. And market timing in a, a range-bound environment is pretty different than it is in a trending environment. So we're treating it as such. And we're trying to be really uh, clear in our research imparting the time frame that we're discussing because we are bullish right now, but right now being maybe with a duration of three to four weeks. Uh, you know, we, we've been all, you know, on board with this relief rally, um, but we would suspect that after 
April's wonderful positive seasonal influences that we have at hand, when once those dissipate, we may get into a place where it is indeed one of those sell in May types of years. Um, but the, the bias doesn't come from seasonals, it comes from the indicators. Again, we saw a short term breakout by the S&P 500, you saw it above the 50 day moving average in green, you saw it above this little shaded cloud model as well. And the subsequent pullback is actually as much as it hasn't felt great. Um, it's actually been pretty healthy and in that it's generating a short term oversold condition for many stocks on what we feel is not major weakness in short term momentum. And there's, of course, some support given the relief rally that preceded it. So, so we're encouraged by the short term uh, setup. And yet we're going to be very adherent um, to any sell signals that arise. Um, and we expect this weekly bar chart at the S&P 500 to be the source of the sell signals that we're going to react to. So if you look at in this bottom window here, this is the weekly stochastic oscillator. When that rolls over, we'll feel like that risk is heightened. It's not always the indicator we're giving the most weight to, but in this environment, it is what we're focused on. Um, here on the MACD, it's somewhat pinched, and that actually shows that intermediate term momentum has improved to a pretty notable degree, um, but intermediate term can be as short as just a few weeks. So we're encouraged, but not uh, feeling like we have necessarily a good long-term or even necessarily an intermediate term entry at hand here. Uh, but this is an important chart because it shows support for the S&P. It's uh, based in part on a Fibonacci retracement level in gray here, sort of previous peaks and or well, troughs and peaks and um, on the chart. And you can see that it held successfully in Q1, um, albeit a hard test. If it were to break, especially if it also breaks this shaded cloud area, that would then support downside follow through and suggest that this correction that we've seen is indeed the start of something worse. So, so we're focused on these uh, potential sell signals, although we don't have them right now. Um, you know, and that would be our, uh, I guess, indication to hedge equity market exposure. And, and I'll stop there, Blake, if you want to uh, maybe sort of focus on the, the big picture. Yeah, I, I I'd like to ask a couple of questions, just like while we're 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 where we're at in this pre, in your presentation, and, and you know, top down analysis and, and top up analysis, the way you define them is great, and I think it's very easy to understand for for most of the traders. But you know, you also mentioned you use the Demark indicators. You're you're flashing out a, a MACD and maybe some oscillators. How many indicators do you typically use just for your 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 basic analysis that you do on the broader markets is there is there a, a, a certain amount and there are there more are there certain ones that you focus on more than others? Yeah, there certainly are. And if you bear with me here, I'm going to try to uh, pull this up. If you can bear with me, trying to get to the sure. other slide deck that I have opened up. Um, you know, there are a lot of indicators that we use, um, but we, we classify them three ways. We're looking at um, what we consider to be trend following gauges or momentum gauges. We're also looking at overbought or oversold measures, as you saw there. And then we're looking at uh, relative strength gauges and relative strength for us usually means comparative ratios on the sector versus market front. And those three categories, I would say we have about maybe, um, you know, one or two really key indicators that we're using for each category, you know, add that up, that gives us about six indicators. Um, it's not the right number necessarily for everyone, um, but it, it does give us enough of a sort of a binary response from the market price action that we can then have good information on our side. So let me um, make this a little bit and, bigger and, here. And yeah, if you, while you're making that bigger, I think this is an important topic for so many traders, especially those that are newer in the business. And 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 let me let me stop and and just kind of get your opinion on this is because. I think uh, working with so many traders over the last 20 some odd years, this is what I've found, uh, Katie, is that, you know, I, I, I've always followed a very simplistic approach. If people that know my analysis, they, 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 and they've been following me for the last couple of decades or more, they, they know my charts never really change. You know, I'm always looking at the same thing. And I, I've, I've been, you know, really following your analysis for several years and, and, and having one-on-one -on -one discussions with you. What I've also noticed is what you do doesn't change either. And I think a lot of traders are always trying to look for the next best indicator out there that's going to, quote unquote, make them more money or maybe risk less money, whatever the case may be. But 
how comfortable are you? I guess this is the question I should be asking somebody who's been doing this for so many years. How comfortable are you ever adding a new indicator to to your you know the, your typical do your typical trend indicators that you're following right now? Not very. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, okay. Uh, and you probably knew the answer to that, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I think the last one I tried to add was something called the Rex oscillator. It was something that I was getting off the Bloomberg terminal. And, and I, I was intrigued by um, the composure of that indicator. But then I found that it just ended up being somewhat duplicative to what I was already looking at. And that's, that's often the problem, right? Because we only have really two data points that the market's giving us price and volume. And so as far like as, as a trend following gauge, if you have more than two or three, you're probably um, letting your confirmation bias get in the way because you're gonna choose whichever one, you know, it favors your current views for, for whatever reason. Um, sure. So I think you need to kind of keep yourself honest by just going back to the same indicators. I don't even think it's as important what those indicators are, except that they're trying to tell you, uh, you know, these categories of, of items. Okay, what is the momentum behind that that stock? That's a trend following gauge. What is, you know, is it overstretched the upside or downside? That's an overbought oversold gauge. So as long as you have a couple inputs on those fronts, I think people would be well served by that, but it doesn't matter whether you use uh, this, this my trusty stochastic oscillator here or the uh, RSI. Nope, probably doesn't matter all that much. I just think it's um, important that you have an input that's going to give you that takeaway, whether it's it overbought or oversold. Right, it's the consistent inputs that it and it's it's drawing in. It, it's it's spitting you out a, a an outcome, but it's what you do with that outcome that's really the determining factor. It's I, I kind of explain it to people like, uh, look, Katie, I, I'm going to give you the same hammer that I have, and we're going to go to a wall and we're going to take a nail and use that hammer to hit it into the wall. But the way that you swing the hammer and the way I swing the hammer might vary a little bit and the results that we get might vary a little bit as well but we still have the same hammer and the same nail and the same wall right yeah and i mean when you talk to multiple technical analysts like we can very distinctly have different views <laughs> so yeah. and we often do um so i mean part of that does come from the indicators that we're using perhaps um but also it is it, it's subjective at the end of the day um what i like to use the indicators for is to make it less subjective at least in my opinion where some of these indicators will actually give you a, like a proper buy or sell signal um, in generating some kind of crossover, for example. And that that to me is a binary result. And it just, you know, you can't say it's not on a MACD buy signal if it's on a MACD buy signal. Yeah. Um, so, so I like having that kind of black and white takeaway from the markets. Um, you know, it puts us in a position where, um, you know, if we're wrong on our bias, then we won't stay there for very long because the market and the indicators won't really let us. Well, that's great. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to save the rest of what I was going to ask for when we talk about your ETF a little bit later, because I think it's important that I that I that I ask some of these questions because I think they're going to be pretty important questions that I'm really curious to know. But um, uh, looking at the S and P and and moving along, you know, past the S and P, what um, how I, I guess I want to ask how much do you factor into correlations? Because when you're looking at the S and P and you go, oh, you know, I'm I'm, I'm I have. Uh, you know, I'm doing my top-down analysis, but I think certain sectors of the S&P or maybe the broader markets are are looking like this. Do you, do you also then start to factor in correlations that in, maybe in other intermarket uh, correlations rather? We do. Um, I would say not on a consistent basis necessarily, but we kind of play around with it when we suspect something's going on. Sure. Uh, we'll just use the cor correlation functionality to determine if correlations are increasing, decreasing, if they've been very strong recently, is that normal? Um, but we never let that inform our bias. Our bias is coming from that same methodology that we've always held. Uh, but I can't tell you how many questions I've gotten about um, you know, Bitcoin being more highly correlated to the equity market and high growth. Um, so, so that's the kind of scenario in which I, I'm curious, right? But I'm not using it to, to um, guide my positioning in Bitcoin, but rather to say, okay, well, I'm going to acknowledge that it's asking or acting like a risk asset and treat it accordingly. 
And so I think it's a matter of changing your paradigm a little bit, maybe when you think about something as yeah. it is correlated to something else. But there, I've always found that it's pretty dicey to rely on correlations, um, you know, ones that are historical and, and long term. They, they may matter a whole lot over the long term, but over the short term, they can really break up and, and damage a portfolio. I mean, think about treasuries and their move in, in Q1. I think that caught a lot of folks off guard because it wasn't normal, right? Um, so to take that and, and acknowledge it, but then also take the overlay of the momentum gauges and just, you know, the momentum gauges are going to keep it real, right? Um, yeah. They're, they're going to tell you if it's on a sell signal or a buy signal. Well, you know, I, I know you get a million questions regarding Bitcoin. So I, I have to ask it while it's fresh in my mind, because you put it in my mind. <laughs> as far as Bitcoin goes, are, are you worried about like the underperformance of the the crypto? I mean, if you if you look at it from as a risk asset, you acknowledge it as you mentioned as a risk asset. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I look at it technically Bitcoin, and I see it. It just it could not break back above the two hundred day moving average, and if it is a risk asset, it sure isn't acting so hot right now. Um, what do you have any views of Bitcoin in its current environment? And and I know, and I have to make sure I, I stop here and say that you know Bitcoin and maybe some of the other major cryptos are definitely not the same as a lot of the uh, the altcoins, if you will. Um, but just keeping in 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 the you know keeping Bitcoin, I guess, in the in the major conversation. What are your thoughts here regarding this crypto? Yeah, I mean, well, listen, it, it, when you look at it on this weekly candlestick chart, you can see what's been established in sort of a gradual but super wide long term uptrend channel um, yeah. with this, this, well, hang on, just with the peaks and the troughs that have developed over the past, um, you know, year or so, right? So you could kind of draw a channel here. Um, it's funny because you make me think of, of, you know, it is resist called resistance for a reason, right? That 200 day moving average, very natural place for some kind of consolidation or pullback to develop for just about anything because it holds some psychological significance. So the pullback or retreat from that 200 day, which is also, if you see here, um, a retreat from the cloud, which showed the shaded area. So that upper boundary, the cloud is a minor resistance level as well. It's sort of a natural place for that to happen. And it's not necessarily bearish. Um, you know, I think it's something that, that we then take and say, well, how is that impacting the indicators? And if you were to look at these indicators down here, you see some green, that's a MACD buy signal on the weekly chart. And you see this weekly stochastic oscillator pointing higher. So that means momentum has improved. Uh, and it, while it is overbought, it doesn't have any kind of overbought sell signal yet. Our bias has been for a test of resistance that's more secondary to the 200 day moving average. And that's of roughly 51,000. This, this whole uh, sort of wide channel that's developed does mark a loss of long-term upside momentum, similar to what we had on that uh, monthly chart of the S&P 500. So it does share that loss of uh, upside momentum, but we're giving Bitcoin and also Ether the benefit of the doubt, as long as this sort of cloud-based support is intact, because that to us is what defines that gradual uptrend channel. So for now, we're assuming that it's range bound like the equity market, but has good support. And we're going to concern ourselves with these short term swings one way or the other and try to benefit from those by using these indicators and otherwise maintain somewhat of a neutral bias until we can really get out of this um, sort of phase characterized by weakened momentum. Well, you know, Katie, I, I got to say that back in, uh, I want to say it was uh, September or October of last year, maybe before we hit those brand new fresh highs, I would say it's probably late September. Uh, you were one of the very few people that I interviewed, and I interview a lot of people, one of the very few people that were calling for new highs in Bitcoin. Everybody was thinking that we were going to stop short of new highs, and you were calling for new highs. And so uh, hats off to you. It hit new highs and then reversed. <laughs> well, thank you. They, they didn't they didn't stay there all that, that long. But um... No, but it still hit new highs. I, I give yeah, you that. there you go. Now, now um, again, I'll I want to reiterate, I want to reiterate that, um, you know, we, we have Katie here for probably about another, uh, you know, 
25, 30 minutes. If you have any questions for her specifically, especially regarding technical analysis, for those of you that you know use charts, uh, please, this is a, a great time to be asking some questions, thinking about them. But I have a question for you, just because we were talking about the 200 day moving average. You know, uh, you, you mentioned it, you know, the 200 day moving average is something that, you know, we're paying attention to. I think everybody should have it on its chart. And they always ask me, well, why, Blake? You know, why aren't you using the 200 EMA or maybe, you know, some, some, you know, different type of averages? And I'm like, because everybody's looking at it. If everybody's looking at it, I should probably be knowing and at least cognizant of where it's at. Maybe I won't use it, but that's kind of my take. How do you view the 200 day moving average versus any other moving average for that matter? Um, I think just like you said, I, I kind of want to look at what everybody else is looking at. Um, it, it can be so self-fulfilling, um, but at a very minimum, we can use the 200 day as like a gauge of the prevailing long-term trend. So this is a Dow Jones industrial average chart that I kind of love and I'll show you why, but this, this purple line is the 200 day and you can see it's flattened. So that to me sort of affirms that we're in probably a range bound environment. Uh, you know, so I'd like to know what that kind of um, trajectory and curvature is of the 200 day. And we also think about it in terms of support and resistance at times, um, but th this chart Chart brings up sort of a, a point that often comes up in the media about the yeah. death cross, right? Um, right. Which is, is a moving average crossover. So the 50 day below the 200 day moving average when the 200 day moving average is pointing down. And um, we've never been a real big fan of using those for market timing because we feel that, that they're just too late. Um, but this makes a point that it's not just too late, it almost is bullish when you see this death cross, right? <laughs> so, so, it makes for a good headline though, doesn't it? Oh, it does, yeah, it definitely does. But I mean, if you look at the historical death crosses, uh, they've actually been quite good at, at identifying intermediate term lows for, for the Dow Jones industrial average and beyond. So, so we're, we're not a big fan of those crossovers, but we certainly have these moving averages on our radar and often use them as gauges of where there might be buyers stepping in or sellers stepping in. Awesome. You know, and I, and I, like I said, I think it makes for great headlines that the, the death cross markets in turmoil, bah, you know, and yeah, it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah whatever. Um, hey, you know, let's, let's talk about some current market moves that, that are developing right now as we speak, you know, and in, in, in recent, in recent weeks and months, you've been targeting, you know, for the, for the 10 year yield to, to get above two and a half percent. And here we are today. I think we are at 2.69 last I looked and you got the 30 year at 2.72%. And how do you feel about bonds right now? Because you have the, the 10 year you know, note and the 30 year bond, they're both breaking trend lines that, that have been in existence since 2007, I think 2007, it, all the way beyond, to present day. I mean, you, you could draw yeah. some of these trend lines that were trend channels in this case, back to the eighties. Um, right. You know, it just sort of has decelerated, but even still, um, you know, definitely has been in, in this like multi-decade downtrend. And like you said, I mean, we have, this is the uh, tenure yields on a monthly bar chart. You can see that the recent acceleration higher is taking it above this downtrend line. Now we wouldn't think of the downtrend line as like very precise in terms of a resistance level, but it is being tested. And we've been watching 255 or 256 in part because it's also Fibonacci retracement level. So if you clear the, that level um, even more decisively, and by that, I mean, not just in price or well in yield in this case, but also in time. So it spends a couple weeks there that becomes a breakout for treasury yields. And, and then we always focus on next resistance or use maybe some kind of measured move projection to understand where something can go. And with when you look at that uh, for the 10-year treasury yields, we have next resistance of around three and a quarter. Uh, the indicators do point higher. So it suggests mm -hmm. that even if we're gonna get the consolidation that we are expecting here in the near term, that beyond that consolidation phase, we should see a breakout. And I don't know that three and a quarter would be relevant this year, but it would suggest that it is relevant um, in you know the coming, I'd say, year or two. And I know you do. You probably don't think. Well, I don't know how much you think about. It. I guess I should ask. Does, does that factor into anything that you're going to be doing with, let's say, technology stocks like Fang stocks and some of the higher growth stocks? Do you think they're going to be impacted by these higher yields, or is that something like? Again, going to uh, Bitcoin, yeah, I understand the correlation and I understand how that might affect tech stocks, but I'm going to take them one at a time or 
not as a whole group. What What are your thoughts regarding yeah, yields? I think and, it, it does. Growth? It does influence my thinking, um, okay. especially you know when uh, you assume that these things affect the relative strength, and and you can see that already in the technology sector and, and its relative strength versus the broader market. Uh, with this run up in yields, right? It, it certainly has not been great, and um, so it is a consideration. I still default to you going back to those same indicators when I'm analyzing the sectors themselves. So, so it's an input, but it, and it's something that might sway uh, whether I'm looking at something, um, you know, a sell signal, is it something that, I, that I'd act on or, or not, you know, that type of thing, um, but not really in a systematic way. They, these are kind of like what I call macro technicals as it pertains to the equity market. We always look at gold, we always look at crude oil prices, we're looking at treasury yields, we're looking at the dollar index, things that obviously influence equities. And we do let that kind of guide us um, on the, the so-called macro technical front. Well, that's, uh, you know, that, that brings up a question from Cami. She asks, uh, does she follow pre precious metals like gold, silver, platinum, and copper? How, how much do those factor into your decision-making uh, for, for the markets? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a direct relationship to those and, and certain equities, right? So we'll we'll be more excited about Newmont Mining and Freeport McMoran if, if those are uh, stronger commodities and for the underlying commodities, right? Um, but we also think about them as indicative of perhaps defense versus offense. So gold being somewhat of a safe haven. That's one of those long-term correlations you can't always rely upon, uh, but it is something that you know we do tend to see gold at least outperform uh, the S and P 500 when you have a pretty weak tape. So we we look at it for that reason as well, and then just as an alternative asset class, um, you know when when we feel that the equity market's going to be uh, tougher or range bound or downtrending, uh, then it gives us other choices and other places uh, to put our money. So we we definitely have those on our radar. We have essentially a list of maybe I don't know 150 or so kind of macro technical inputs plus uh, major indices around the world plus sector indices and benchmarks, um, all of which really uh, give us the complete picture of what's happening. And then we, you know, here and there, we'll use that to look for opportunities. Let's say we have a breakout or a breakdown in Japan. Uh, we might build a theme around that, something like that. But uh, overall, we'll just let it kind of uh, influence us generally as we evaluate the uh, top-down gauges for the S&P 500. Awesome. Okay. You know, I, I have a question of, um, regarding Bitcoin, going back to Bitcoin. This comes from Jane. And uh, she asked, do you, do you take into consideration Bitcoin having parameters into your bias? Um, for example, we are days away from midpoint of having, uh, having, uh, and there are historically has been sharp sell-offs following the midpoint. So do you take that into consideration at all when you're dealing with Bitcoin? Um, I would say to a lesser degree, um, we certainly, and it, it's like in the same way that, you know, let's say we have a stock split, right? Um, right. You know, we'll, we'll, we like to know, we like to know when earnings are going to hit the tape. We like to know if there's a, a big cash dividend. We like to know if there's a split or a halving for Bitcoin, or if there's just, you know, one of these big events, um, you know, as for Ether. So we want to have those on our radar, um, but we still, we still go back to the indicators and we let those guide us. I'll give you an example um, in terms of the financial sector, which as you know, has been a, a real source of underperformance of late. It's downtrending. We have a lot of short-term breakdowns. Um, and yet, just in the past week, we started to see some signs of downside exhaustion per the DeMarc indicators. And these are mostly short-term signals, but in the likes of a Citigroup or a Morgan Stanley, you start to see these counter-trend signals arise. They're very low conviction when you see them associated with breakdowns. But some of these stocks have really come into support. And guess what? Next week is financial sector earnings kicking off, right? So yeah. I, I just as a, you know, out of curiosity, went back and I kind of looked at the reactions for some of these names that had buy signals uh, to previous earnings reports. And, and that will be something that I, you know, sort of um, either gives me confidence in how I feel about things or otherwise, right? So I, I let it, I guess, influence my conviction level at times, uh, those types of events by just simply going out and, and like visually back testing some of these, um, you know, events that you can drop on a chart. Well, you, that actually is going to parlay into kind of a conversation I wanted to have about your ETF. So if, do you mind we go into that? Oh, please. Yeah. Uh, all right. So so um, 
you know, just uh, I guess it was about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I, I saw you on uh, the set over on CNBC talking to Bob Pisani, you know, who, who you know, everybody who have watched CNBC over the decades knows who he is. And uh, you were talking about um, your your new ETF TAC. And, uh, and I want I want you to explain a little bit about uh, your ETF, because I think it's really cool because you're employing technical analysis or, or you know, in, into an ETF. So can you tell us how that works? And then I've got a, I've got some questions here because from you as a as an ETF manager, I see is very matter of fact, but I got to ask how how much biases come in. So that so tell us a little bit about the ETF. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially like a manifestation of our methodology. So those same indicators that that I showed to you, uh, and then some because we didn't really go through the relative strength inputs or anything like that. We, we took that and took it and built it into a series of rules and built a system using that methodology. Um, and we took that system and applied it to sector indices for the S&P 500. And we felt that it was a really um, great sort of long-term tool to, to identify shifts on the sector front. We believe um, that, that being in the right sector is kind of the key to outperformance. I don't know if I have a lot of sector charts in here, but a great case in point, uh, yeah. communication services. This is a downtrend versus the S&P 500. Um, and wouldn't it be nice to be underweight communication services for the bulk of that uh, down mover phase of underperformance? So, so we wholly believe in, in emphasizing sector relative strength and momentum. So that was kind of the key to the development of, of um, the tax sort of strategy. And um, you know, we take that and we essentially create, a, a, the way I would put it is that we have eight buckets that we want to fill. And we, we ideally in a strong tape would fill all of those buckets with sector spider ETFs representing the strongest sectors in terms of momentum and relative strength with another quantitative overlay um, identifying additional sort of momentum ranking um, now, of course, we're not in the strongest tape. So, so what you see then is when not enough of the sectors are really kind of checking the boxes that we feel are important from a long-term perspective, we will then move that bucket into a combination of risk off assets. So we'll take ETFs that are representing short-term treasuries, long-term treasuries and gold and uh, get sort of a diversified risk off exposure through that also with the ability to move a little bit into cash. So uh, we fill those buckets and eventually there is a point at which all the buckets will be risk off. It's very, very rare, um, you know, having gone back and looked at the strategy over time, it's very, very rare for that to happen. Um, but, you know, that's where you, the key is to minimize drawdown. So our goal primarily with TAC is to leverage the sector leadership and momentum, uh, but then it has that very key sort of risk off asset allocation piece that also helps us minimize drawdowns, um, you know, to a good degree, uh, you know, in, in theory. So, so we are excited about it. I think it's something that, um, you know, it's not a trading oriented product and, and certainly our research sometimes is exactly that somewhat trading oriented. Um, yeah. It is, it is a bit longer term in focus and we're comfortable with that as a first product. It rebalances monthly. Well, I, I, you know, Katie, I think it's awesome, especially in, a, in an environment where personally, I feel that we're going to be in a range bound environment in the markets. Uh, we can define the ranges in, in another conversation, you and I, but I, I think we're going to be in a range bound environment for quite some time and having uh, a, an ETF like yours to be able to navigate through that, I think is going to be very important. It's, it, it is going to be a stock pickers market, in my opinion, and, and maybe a, a, a sector uh, uh, a specific market as, as you are showing here. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you picked up on our navigation theme <laughs> with the tech. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, you know, we are, we're trying to navigate the, any kind of environment, right? So, so what we don't want to see tech do is underperform in strong up markets either, right? So that's why we really place emphasis on being in the right sectors to leverage the upside. And, and we uh, do that in an equal weight fashion in that, let, let's say, 
it's all about energy. Well, we'll be giving more weight to energy than the S&P 500 would be because it has such a small footprint in the S&P 500. And therein we have the ability to perhaps leverage that um, momentum in a different way. So, so it, it's exciting. I think it makes a lot of sense for sort of a um, you know, conservative, but um, still US large cap core equity exposure. And what is, and, and before I, I ask this uh, question that came from MG, um, what is the symbol for, for TAC? So it's T-A-C-K and it's the Fairlead Tactical Sector ETF. There is a website associated with it and it's fairleadfunds.com. And on that website, you can always go in and check the NAV, you can check um, the positions and um, that's another way to reach us if you wanted to perhaps take a research trial on a subscription basis, or if you were interested in just getting some more information about the fund itself, we're still in, um, you know, a sort of building our materials mode. So, so we are, are trying to develop sort of a, a nice one or two pager that has all of the frequently asked questions that we've started to receive. So hopefully soon that'll be available too. Well, I'm super excited for you, Katie. And I know this has been something you've been talking about for, for quite some time. And, it, and I, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be part of watching it come to fruition and, bring, and coming to market. So congrats Thank to you. you and your team. Thank you so much. All right. Well, um, I, I had a question that came in from MG, and this is a kind of an important one. Uh, MG said, is she going to be allowed to finish showing which indicator she uses and how? Uh, she had some slides, but got cut off. Would love to see them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can go back to that. So um, these here, these were the market slides that I brought. And um, so we covered most of the top down material. The sector relative strength, as mentioned, is highly important. The relative strength indicators are comparative ratios, which is what you see here. So this is like the consumer discretionary index. And then this is that index divided very simply like price to price. Uh, divided by the S&P 500. And behind the scenes, like when we're looking at these relative strength comparative ratios, we're taking those same indicators that you saw briefly, DeMarc indicators, stochastics, moving averages, and we're looking at those behind the scenes, but we try to present it in a little bit of a more digestible, clear manner <laughs> in our reports. Um, and you can really see these, uh, you know, trends that become very decisive. Healthcare is a great example of a, a longer term turnaround that's unfolded. So we try to make sure to leverage these sector rotational trends um, and also let that uh, sort of enhance whether we feel like it's sort of a risk on or risk off type of environment. So that's one uh, way we, we use the relative strength. Another way, um, this is large cap growth versus value and small cap growth versus value. So another uh, ratio that we hold, uh, hold very important in our work, we have a lot of people that are very heavily exposed to growth. And so they want to know, well, how much, how much more room does it have to outperform? Is it short term? Is it long term? And we can discern some of that from the ratios themselves. Um, what I'll try to get to briefly, I'm sure we're not long on time here, would be um, just in terms of the, bear with me, uh, in terms of the other relative strength gauge that we tend to use, that would be um, the RRG. So that's a, a relative rotation graph, and it's uh, basically a normalized view of relative strength. So it takes those same types of price to price ratios and uh, normalize that, them against a benchmark. So let me show you one of those just because it's really fascinating. Um, That'd be cool. Yeah, I'm gonna have to skip forward a little bit here, um, but it, it's really very cool in terms of a visual gauge of sector performance. This is our, our teach-in, an old teach-in, so let me get to the right place here. Oh, here we go. Oh, this one's cool. We'll, we'll look at this one. Uh, wow, this that is, one made my head spin. <laughs> <laughs> it's animated, which, uh, yeah, it took us a long time to figure out how to do that. That's great. Um, so this is, uh, you know, sort of a, a collection of altcoins uh, versus Bitcoin. So um, on this axis, you see, or on the x-axis, you see a sort of a, a relative strength ratio. Uh, this, by the way, is developed by someone named Julius de Kempener, super smart technician based out of Holland. Uh, and so this is your relative strength ratio, and this is the momentum of that ratio. So it presumes that there's cyclicality to markets, which we all 
probably agree upon. Um, and you, it, it's hard to see, but if you just track one or two of these, you can see they sort of move clockwise around the middle, the middle representing Bitcoin to which everything is normalized. So if you see something pointing up and to the right, you're seeing outperformance, you're seeing it with growing momentum. As soon as it turns over, then it's losing momentum. Like you see Polygon at the end, they're pointing down. Um, you know, that means it's still in an uptrend in relative terms, but it's lost some momentum. So you can make some decisions based on this rotational view. And, and we certainly do a lot of that with um, our sector sort of uh, rotation work. This is not the best example of cyclicality. It's just a 10 day view that we're, we're looking at, uh, but you can kind of see and energy is skewing things as, as it sometimes does, uh, but you, you can see these trajectories and, and act upon them um, as they unfold. There's also um, very much cyclicality from a bottom-up perspective that we watch too. Like if you look at um, you know, the semiconductors versus the socks, um, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, uses for that, especially if you're a portfolio manager and you have both long and short positions uh, as a great sort of portfolio checkup tool. We, we love that. Um, so as you saw, we have those three categories of, of indicators. Um, the indicators have different variations and, and things like that, but, but we feel that um, usually something close to the standard parameters that are out there in the world tend to be pretty sufficient. Um, so like for the MACD indicator, we're using standard parameters that you'd pull up on stockcharts.com, um, whereas uh, you know we tweak it a little bit for stochastics more just because our mentor taught us that way, uh, but we generally think the standard parameters are, are quite sufficient. I hope that helps. I think that answered a lot of questions. So I got, I got a question about your uh, ETF really quick from from uh, from Don. He, he asked, can you explain how you came up with the frequency of rebalancing your ETF? Because you, you mentioned it was on a monthly basis. Yeah, the monthly rebalance is in part because we're using monthly data, right? So intra-month, uh, you know, if you're if you're making a change in response to monthly data intra-month, you have like what I would consider to be unconfirmed signals. Um, you know, you can anticipate signals, but um, there is sometimes risk in that. I, I call it anticipating the anticipators. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it sometimes um, it doesn't usually work in your favor. Um, so we we tested all different types of approaches. Uh, using daily data, but with an eye towards the long term, uh, using weekly data, trying to get one week ahead of, of the start of the next month, that type of thing. But we found um, that just over time, the monthly data um, that we could you know, um, retrieve at month end was really the, the most informational and timely um, in terms of the, the major trend shifts that are being identified uh, by our, our systems. So uh, we just found that it really tested the best. Awesome. Well, you know, Katie, I want to say thank you so much for, for, for being here with us today, uh, I, especially at such a historic time for you and uh, uh, over at Fairlead and your, your team. I think it's truly a historic event, a milestone that you have reached as, as a company. And uh, I'm super excited for you. And I'm really glad that you got to share all of this wonderful analysis, your process, and all this information with the Traders Summit community. So thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, good to see everyone. Thanks so much, Blake. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, love to, love to, love to catch up with you soon. All right, thanks, Katie. Sounds good. Take care. All right, take care.